Hey guys, Mr. Backberg here. In this video, we're going to look at some relationships between arcs and chords in circles. Now remember, when we're talking about a circle and a chord, a chord is a segment that has both of its endpoints on the outer edge of our circle. And what that does is it splits our circle into two smaller arcs. The top arc, since it takes up most of the circle, it's over halfway. This is a major arc. And the bottom arc, since it's less than half the circle, is a minor arc. Now I guess one thing that could happen as we're looking at our circle, that chord could go directly through the middle of our circle, then it would be a diameter. And a diameter splits a circle exactly in half and creates two semicircles. So the arc on top and on bottom are both semicircles because they're both half of the circle. Now the first property that I want to deal with with chords and arcs is dealing with creating congruent arcs within a circle. Or this also works for congruent circles. So our property says in the same circle, or this also works for congruent circles like I said before, two minor arcs can only be congruent if the chords that create those minor arcs are also congruent. So I'm going to draw a picture to illustrate this. So let's say we've got a singular circle and we draw in two chords within that circle. For these two minor arcs on the outside to be congruent, then these two chords have to be congruent. So if this chord is exactly the same size as this chord, then this arc on the left hand side is going to be congruent to the arc on the right hand side. So I'm going to give these names. Let's call this A and B, and let's call this one C, D. So if segment AB, that chord, is congruent to segment CD, then the two arcs, the arc AB, will be congruent to the arc CD. Because the two chords are congruent, that makes these two minor arcs on the outside also congruent. So let's say we're looking at these two circles. We've got circle A and we've got circle D. Now we know that these two circles are congruent because their radius is the exact same length. Remember, that's what makes a pair of circles be congruent, having the same length radius. We also have the chord BC being marked as congruent to the chord EF. So what that means is that these two arcs that are created, the arc that runs from B to C, has to be congruent to the arc that runs from E to F. So if this arc over here is a 70 degree arc, then automatically this arc that runs from E to F also has to be a 70 degree arc because those arcs have to be congruent. We're dealing with congruent chords within congruent circles, so the arcs that are intercepted also have to be congruent. This example is along the same lines. We've got circle H here. We've got the chord that runs from E to F, and its length is eight. We've also got the chord that runs from F to G, and its length is eight. So since these chords have the same length, they're automatically congruent. Now let's say that this arc that runs from E to F was a 100 degree arc. Then, because our two chords are congruent, the chord that runs from E to F is congruent to the chord that runs from F to G, that means the arcs also have to be congruent. So this has to be a 100 degree arc. Our next property with chords deals with perpendicular bisectors. So if a chord is a perpendicular bisector of another chord, then that first chord has to be a diameter of our circle. So let's draw a picture to represent this. Here's our circle, and let's call this chord AB. Now let's say that we draw in another chord. I'm going to call this one CD. Now, CD is going to be perpendicular to AB. It's also going to split AB in half. So, since CD is a perpendicular bisector, it's both perpendicular and it cuts that chord in half, since CD is a perpendicular bisector of AB, then CD has to be a diameter. It has to go through the center point of our circle. That last property can also be helpful if we're looking at a diameter already. So let's say we had a chord and we drew in the diameter. And let's say that diameter was perpendicular to that chord. 
Since the diameter is perpendicular to this chord, then automatically, because of that last property, it also has to bisect this chord. So if we knew that the small chord across the bottom, let's say that its length was 10, then because this diameter splits it in half, each individual piece would have to be five units long because we're bisecting that chord. We're cutting it in half. We've got one more property dealing with chords. So this is going to work if two chords are in the same circle or if they're in congruent circles. So two chords are going to be congruent, again, if they're in the same circle or if they're in congruent circles, if they are the same exact distance away from the center point of our circle. So let's draw out a picture. In this circle, our center point, let's call that point A. Let's say we've got a chord up here, we'll call this BC. And let's say we've got another chord down here, we'll call this one DE. Those two chords can only be congruent if they're the same exact distance away from point A. So if we know for sure that this distance from A to the top chord is exactly the same as the distance from A to the bottom chord, then we can safely say that these two chords are congruent. This also does work the other direction. If we know that the two chords are congruent, then automatically they have to be the same exact distance away from that center point. In this last example, we've got a couple of chords. We've got chord A, B, and C, D. Now each of those lengths is 15, so those chords are congruent. Because those chords are congruent, that means that the distance from each chord to the center point also has to be congruent. So this piece has to be congruent to this piece. We're given a couple of algebraic expressions, so we're going to use the fact that these two pieces have to be congruent in order to solve for x. Because those things are congruent, we can set those expressions equal to each other. So 4x minus 2 equals 2x plus 14. And then we're going to do some solving. I'm going to subtract the 2x over to the left-hand side. So we get 2x minus 2 equals 14. I'm going to add the 2 over to the right-hand side, so we get 2x equals 16. And then our last step is going to be to divide by the 2, so we end up with an x value of 8. That's going to be it for this video. Thanks for watching.